welcome to the Newington Green Meeting House. Take a pew. You've arrived at just the right time to hear Minister Richard Price give one of his sermons. That is to say, in the 1760s. See the man at the pulpit in front of you with the wig that looks like huge white earmuffs? That's Price, renowned preacher, philosopher and mathematician. Not to mention extremely well-connected man. How many other people do you know who could count Prime Minister William Pitt the Elder, pioneering feminist Mary Wollstonecraft and free founding fathers of the United States of America among their friends? If this were a cathedral, your eyes might start to wander around the ornate interior during the service. But this is a dissenter's meeting house, and we are more into plain decor. The most indulgent we got was some wooden panelling that framed the preacher in their imposing pulpit. A section of the survives in the 21st century. Can you see it behind the stage? But no spires, altars or gold. The fewer distractions you see, the more we can focus on the things that matter. Ideas, inclusivity and a fair society. So if you're an independent thinker, and you look like you are, you're in the right place. Newington Green has been a hub of revolutionary ideas for over 300 years. Way back when it was a village separated from the city of London by fields. Even before our meeting house was built in 1708, this spot was home to a dissenting academy, a progressive school and nursery for revolutionaries. Today the clothes are different, although we're sure the rough will make a comeback and there are more pizzerias. But this little meeting house is still a place where free-thinking individuals gather to talk and plan a better future. Take a look around and hear the stories of extraordinary people who have been a part of our congregation and shaped world history. Richard Price was minister here from 1758 to 1783. The meeting house's heyday is the centre of rational dissent. If you hopped in a time machine and went back 250 years, you'd find him up at the pulpit preaching to a packed house. Born in Wales, Price was raised as a nonconformist, meaning as a Protestant, but not following the established church, the Church of England. At the time, laws such as the Act of Uniformity of 1662 and the Toleration Act of 1688 limited what nonconformists could do. They could not hold civil or military office, could not be awarded degrees from Oxford or Cambridge universities, and did not even have freedom to worship unless they were prepared to swear an oath of loyalty to the crown. So when Price moved to London, age 17, it was to study maths and physics at a dissenting academy in Moorfields. Luckily for Price, his teacher in London had been friends with the Sir Isaac Newton. Take that, Oxbridge. In 1758, Price and his wife, Sarah Blundell, moved to number 54, the Green, a handsome building that still stands just a stone's throw away from here. It's London's oldest brick terrace house. See if you can spot it as you leave today. It's on the west side of the Green. Price's popularity as a minister grew alongside his fame as a leading figure of the 18th centuryist Enlightenment. A true polymath, member of the Royal Society, and pioneer in the mathematics of probability, he saw himself as a citizen of the world, campaigning for religious freedom and parliamentary reform, and becoming a vocal supporter of both the American and the French revolutions. Imagine if world leaders started to pour through the meeting house doors behind you, looking for inspiration about how to shape the future of their nations. Well, that's more or less what happened in Price's time. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John and Abigail Adams, Pitt the Elder, all came here to share conversation and political ideas with their friend. Among the English establishment, however, Price was viewed as dangerous. In 1789, he gave a bold sermon, a discourse on the love of our country, calling for rights for dissenters and celebrating the beginning of the French Revolution. Philosopher Edmund Burke wrote a vicious response, Reflections on the Revolution in France, which embodied the fears of the elite that people like Price might spark a British revolution. This in turn triggered a pamphlet war, 
a back and forth battle of angry intellectual essays over the issues thrown up by the revolution. Price's friend, Mary Wollstonecraft, at a time when women were decidedly not meant to meddle in politics, jumped in to defend him with her own pamphlet, A Vindication of the Rights of Men. Thomas Paine followed soon after with his famous Rights of Man. Price's fame and religious and political convictions place him at the centre of revolutionary thought in a period of intense global upheaval. And yet, those who knew him personally recalled a small, earnest, quiet man, known for his kindness to children, for riding a half-blind horse, and for his occasional hijinks. Sure, he might engage you in intellectual debate, but then again he might challenge you to a hopping race from here to Stoke Newington as he did once to a chap called Mr. Holton. They both ended up sprawled in a bush, giggling. <laughs> Price won the race. You are in the presence of greatness. Mary Wollstonecraft, founding mother of modern feminism, was the most famous person to breathe the air of this meeting house. She had a regular spot right here in one of the box pews, number 19, which was perhaps the 18th century equivalent of holding an Arsenal season ticket. Though Mary was born into relative prosperity, she had a tough childhood, and her father's failed ventures meant she arrived in adulthood, poor but respectable. Mary had few prospects, marriage, governessing, needlework, and she relished none of them. Wollstonecraft arrived in Newington Green, aged 25, in dramatic circumstances, homeless, unemployed, and accompanied by her sister, who was fleeing a destructive marriage. Her fortunes had changed after meeting Hannah Berg, a member of the congregation who introduced her to the village. Hannah helped her set up a successful school on the Green, where she employed her sisters and friends. Mary was an independent thinker and attended both the Anglican church nearby and this meeting house. The radical community here appreciated clever women and encouraged her to develop her own political and intellectual ideas. Wollstonecraft and Richard Price became friends. Through his circle, she met Joseph Johnson, who became her lifelong publisher, starting with Thoughts on the Education of Daughters which was written as a riposte to a former member of the congregation, James Berg. Berg believed girls should be educated only for their roles as housewives, whereas Mary insisted, I wish them to be taught to think. Her essay in support of the French Revolution, A Vindication of the Rights of Men, was a success, but she was not content with promoting the rights of men alone. So two years later, she published A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Here, she demanded justice for one half of the human race. Wollstonecraft attacked women's slavish position in marriage and argued they should receive proper education and that men and women should be held to the same moral standards. She believed passionately that the whole of society would benefit if women were given their rights. Wollstonecraft was as unconventional in her love life as everything else. She pursued a married artist, Henry Fuseli, then fled to France, arriving shortly before Louis XIV was guillotined. In Paris, she fell in love with American revolutionary soldier Gilbert Imlay and gave birth to her first daughter, Frances. Imlay registered her as his wife to protect her, but no wedding actually took place. After the relationship ended, Wollstonecraft went back to London, where she was reintroduced to anarchist philosopher William Godwin. This was a passionate, loving relationship. Wollstonecraft fell pregnant again, and the pair married, exposing the fiction of her first marriage, which caused some outrage. Tragically, the birth of her second daughter, also called Mary, was followed by Wollstonecraft's death from puerperal fever. She was only 38. Mary Jr. went on to achieve her own fame as Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein. Godwin published a memoir of his beloved wife, but his frankness was twisted and used to characterize Wollstonecraft as an irreligious, immoral fanatic, a view that stuck for over a century. Though she was later celebrated by suffragettes and by writers including George Eliot and Virginia Woolf, it was not until the 1970s 
when a new wave of feminism erupted that her reputation as a feminist pioneer was reignited. Today, Newington Green is a focus for the many who wish to celebrate her extraordinary achievements. Another remarkable woman from our all-star congregation was Anna Letitia Barbold. If you live locally, you may recognize the name from Barbold Road, just north of here, but her life was longer and had more twists and turns. Anna moved to nearby Stoke Newington in 1802 when her husband, Rochemont Barbold, was appointed as the new minister at this meeting house. She was 59 years old and a celebrated author, poet and educator. Soon she joined a circle of radical intellectuals led by Joseph Johnson, who had been Mary Wollstonecraft's publisher. Barbold was born in Leicestershire in a house that doubled up as a dissenting academy, which her father ran. Soaking up the atmosphere, she was able to read by the age of two Despite her mother's efforts to suppress her natural intellect, she persuaded her father to teach her classics, Latin and Greek. She grew up both super smart and uncomfortable with the defined role that was expected of her as a woman. In 1773, she published her first book of poems to wide acclaim. The year after, despite some misgivings, Anna married Rochemont it was to be the start of a long and tumultuous relationship. They soon created a small family of their own by adopting one of her brother's children. Teaching ran thick in Anna's blood and the Barbolds moved to Suffolk to run a school. This, combined with motherhood and her passion for equal education, led her to write Lessons for Children, an innovative programme that influenced the teaching of reading to children for generations. After a tour of France, the Barbolds moved to Hampstead, and in the 1790s, Anna began to write powerful political articles. She attacked discrimination against religious dissenters and lambasted Parliament's failure to abolish the slave trade, sometimes through satirical verse. By the time the Barbolds moved to Stoke Newington and Rochemont took over the pastoral duties of the meeting house, his mental health had started deteriorating. He became prone to fits of insane fury directed against his wife. One day at dinner he seized a knife and chased Anna around the table until she saved herself by jumping out of the window. In 1808, Rochemont drowned himself in the New River, not far from here. Anna Letitia Barbold remained in Stoke Newington, grief-stricken. When she returned to writing, she published a stinging, ambitious poem titled 1811, criticising Britain's involvement in the Napoleonic Wars. It went down like a lead cannonball and was torn apart in the conservative press. She never published again. After her own death in 1825, Barbold was belittled like many women writers, as merely a children's author, and soon her approach to education went out of fashion too. Only recently has her work been reappraised. She is now considered an important early romantic poet and educationalist. Literary darling, poet and banker, it's not a combination you often hear these days, but Samuel Rogers used his great wealth to indulge in a life of art. He was friends with Wordsworth, Walter Scott and Byron, and for a while he was England's literary gatekeeper. If you were invited to one of his glittery literary breakfasts, you knew were bound for fame and success. Rogers was also Newington Green through and through, he was born here in 1763, educated locally in the excellent dissenting academies of the area, and was a member of this meeting house from childhood when Richard Price was preacher as well as his next door neighbour. 
Perhaps inspired by Price, Rogers hoped to become a minister, but his father persuaded him to follow him into the family trade, banking. Rogers obliged, but his interests always lay more in the arts, and he studied English literature as a young man. He published a number of well-regarded works, including The Pleasures of Memory, Epistle to a Friend, and Human Life. Rogers was known as a great conversationalist and a fan of cutting put-downs, which he justified by saying he had such a small voice that no one listened if he said nice things. Sir Walter Scott said of him, It matters not what ill we say of Rogers behind his back, since we may be pretty certain that he has said as much of us behind our backs. For all his reputation as a wit and tastemaker, Samuel was undeniably also a talented writer. In 1850, on Wordsworth's death, Rogers was asked to succeed him as a poet laureate, but declined on account of his old age. For the last five years of his life, he was confined to his chair after falling over on the street. He died aged 92, an amazing age for the time. The Pritchards were another important family in our congregation and led an energetic revival of the meeting house roughly a hundred years after the heyday of Richard Price. Andrew Pritchard became the congregational treasurer between 1850 and 1873 and must have been quite the salesman as he oversaw a doubling of donations and a growth in membership. He was also a lifelong dissenter and Unitarian, believing in one God in Christianity, not the Trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit that formed the doctrine of the Church of England. Pritchard was also a keen scientist. He was a friend of Michael Faraday of electromagnetic fame and his cousins were involved in the development of optic lenses and the transatlantic telegraph cable. Surrounded by science and fascinated by natural history, Pritchard developed a passion for microscopy, examining and interrogating the world through a microscope. This in itself was a dissenting act at the time, searching for truth, when the prevailing Christian views held simply that the Lord God made them all, and that nature was to be worshipped rather than studied with an open mind. The Pritchards were one of those big and energetic families who liked to take over, and within a few decades of Andrew's arrival in 1840, there were over 20 members of his family who were engaged with remodelling and updating the meeting house. In this period, the schoolhouse was built, and the apse, the semicircular area, and gallery were added to the main hall, leading some visitors to start calling it a chapel or even a church. Two of the dynamic Pritchards were Ion and Marion, both children of Andrew and his wife Caroline. Together they ran summer schools to train Sunday school teachers. Marion wrote a great deal of children's literature and was so prolific that a generation of children knew her by her pen name, Aunt Amy. Samuel Sharp was nephew to Samuel Rogers and was born into the same banking dynasty, though his childhood was not exactly idyllic. When Sharp was just seven, both his mother and father died, leaving him and five siblings in the care of a half-sister. The new family moved to Stoke Newington Church Street and Samuel, like his uncle, became a keen member of this meeting house and adopted its Unitarian views. For years, Sharp and his brothers gave classes for poor children at a school in Harp Alley, Farringdon, which they squeezed in before office hours at the bank. Sharp married in 1827 and went on to have six children. His daughters used to help him trace Egyptian inscriptions at the British Museum, where he was busy developing a vocabulary of hieroglyphics. He went on to write several histories of Egypt and worked for years on an improved translation of the Bible from Hebrew. Samuel Sharp died in 1881 and is buried in Abney Park Cemetery not far from here. His daughters Matilda and Emily played a prominent role in the chapel's Sunday school at a time when it was growing into a day school for the local poor. 
Later, they used their inheritance to found the Channing School for Girls, which was primarily for the daughters of Unitarian ministers and remains a respected independent school today. Memorials were not a prominent feature of the Meeting House in its early history, partly because there were no tombs or graves, but perhaps also because of the dissenters' view that to focus on ideas without distraction, it was better to keep the walls plain. Nonetheless, memorial plaques did start to appear in the 19th century. Tablets commemorating Anna Letitia Barbold and Richard Price were installed in 1841, long after both of their deaths. Though more memorials followed throughout the Victorian period, they were generally to preachers or prominent or wealthy members of the congregation. By contrast, this war memorial remembers the rest of the people who attended this meeting house, the ordinary congregation members who came here to think and talk, but who also formed part of the wider fabric of society, working, looking after their families, and either volunteering or being conscripted to risk their lives fighting in the muddy trenches. Although this plaque only lists men, many women from the congregation also made great sacrifices during the war. During a peak in congregation numbers a few years before the First World War, one George Smith was awarded a special Sunday School Prize for his contributions to congregational life. As we can see from the memorial, he was one of 15 congregation members who served, several having their lives cut tragically short. Smith was sadly one who did not make it home. He enlisted in November 1915, aged 18, and went straight to France. He died in a gas attack on March the 21st, 1918. Over 300 years of history, the beliefs, practices and activities in this meeting house have evolved alongside the needs of the congregation and the larger world. Our amazing community is and always has been what makes us who we are. When the meeting house was first built in 1708, the dissenters' motivation was their rejection of the religious authority of the Church of England, bishops and the king. By the time Richard Price arrived at Newington Green in 1758, there was more of an emphasis on Unitarianism. Unitarians worshipped God alone and believed that Jesus was a fully human prophet rather than divine. Unlike the Church of England, Unitarianism is locally controlled, giving individual congregations and their ministers freedom to decide on their own stances, aims and beliefs. The chapel remained Unitarian in belief for over two centuries, but the forms of services changed over time. Thomas Cromwell, minister from 1838 to 1864, introduced prayer and hymn books and supervised the installation of the first organ. Cromwell also introduced Sunday schools, a library and a savings bank to benefit the growing local population, who were by now more varied in their wealth and status than in earlier days. The size of the chapel's congregation has waxed and waned over the years, at one point shrinking to just nine keen beans. A new lease of life came in 2002 with Minister Cal Courtney, who attracted new members to the congregation and sparked a renewed radical spirit. Courtney led an interfaith vigil on the eve of the march against the Iraq war in 2003 and encouraged LGBTQ people to join the congregation. In 2006, Courtney was succeeded by Andy Pukula and our focus on social justice continued to deepen. Activities of all sorts grew and Sunday attendance has increased about five-fold since then. The congregation supported the church's refusal in 2008 to conduct any weddings at all until equal marriage rights were achieved. It is active in the local community, started a migrant centre, has worked on homelessness, mental health, housing and more. The congregation is unique in giving away all Sunday collections to small local charities to support their good work. 
That said, we're not resting on our laurels. Today we're radically inclusive and the congregation is diverse, but we know there's still work to do. We want to celebrate the stories and achievements of underrepresented groups, champion love and justice, and ask difficult questions. In other words, we're still evolving and very much still dissenting. <laughs>